Hi everyone, my name is Gordon Brown and I'm going to be presenting this introduction to SQL tutorial. I'm a principal software engineer at Codeplay Software where I'm the technical lead on the Compute CPU runtime and a contributor to the SQL working group in Kronos. In this lecture we're going to cover what the SQL 1 specification is and what implementations there are, what the major features of SQL are, what the components of a SQL implementation are and what they do, the anatomy of a typical SQL application, and finally where to find useful resources both for during this tutorial and for after if you wish to continue diving deeper into learning about SQL. So first and foremost, what is SQL? So SQL can be described as a single source, high level, standard C++ programming model that can target a wide range of heterogeneous platforms. Now that's quite a mouthful, so let's break that down and see what it all means. Firstly, SQL is single source. What this means is that unlike traditional C++ applications which have a single compilation path of a source file compiled into an object and then linked to create an executable, SQL applications have two compilation phases, one for the host compiler and one for the device compiler. Unlike traditional heterogeneous programming models like OpenCL, which have two separate sources, one for the host application and one for the device code, SQL has a single source file containing both the host application code and the device code, all in C++. So how does this work? Applications in SQL are written against a single SQL API, and both the host and device compilers parse the same API, but they interpret it differently. First, the device compiler compiles the SQL application and pulls out specific parts to compile SQL kernel functions, generating some form of binary. This is often a standard IR such as Spear or Spear-V, but it can also be a proprietary IR such as PTX or even an ISA for a specific architecture. Then the host compiler compiles the same SQL application but outputs a standard CPU binary, which will run on top of a SQL runtime and queuing to OpenCL, or in some cases another backend. This is then linked with the binary generated by the device compiler to create a single executable that has both the host application code and the device code embedded inside. The one thing to note here is that there is always two compiler passes as I've described, but sometimes this is done by a single compiler driver. Next, SQL is a high-level programming model. This means SQL provides a number of high-level abstractions over common boilerplate code in OpenCL and other backends. This includes things like selecting devices, allocating and copying data, managing dependencies, scheduling, compiling kernels, and much more. To demonstrate this, here we have a comparison of equivalent applications in OpenCL in blue and one in SQL in orange. One of the key goals of SQL is to make simple things simple make the most common behaviour the default, but still provide access to more complex solutions if you need it. SQL is also standard C++, which means unlike many other programming models and languages which require language extensions, pragmas or keywords, SQL doesn't require any of that, it's pure standard C++. This means that any SQL application will compile and run using a SQL library, even if there is no device compiler and no devices available in your system. In fact, this is a feature of SQL. It's called the host device and it's used for debugging kernel functions. Finally, SQL targets a wide range of heterogeneous platforms. SQL is designed to be able to target more devices than any other programming model. SQL can target any device supported by its backend and SQL can target any number of backends. Now, the current SQL 1.2.1 is tied to OpenCL as a backend. So while implementations such as HIPCL and DPC++ support HIP and CUDA backends, they cannot be fully conformant. However, as you will see in another presentation that I'm given in iRoco this year, SQL 2020 more than meets the eye, SQL 2020 is changing that. So what implementations are there and which one is best for you? Firstly, there's DPC++, which is an open source implementation led by Intel as part of their One API solution and is tended to be merged upstream to Clang and LVM. DPC++ supports OpenCL and now CUDA backends through its plugin API. Between these two backends, DPC++ supports Intel CPUs, GPUs and FPGAs, as well as NVIDIA GPUs. Next we have Compute CPP, a commercial implementation developed by Codeplay and optimized for embedded mobile and automotive architectures. Compute CPP supports Intel CPUs and GPUs, ARM Mali GPUs, the Renesis RCAR platforms, and experimental support for NVIDIA GPUs.
Next up we have Tricycle, which is an open source project led by Renan Keriel at Xilinx. Tricycle supports any CPU through OpenMP and TBB, and also has experimental support for Xilinx FPGAs. Next again we have Hipsicle, which is another open source project led by Axel Alpe at the Heidelberg University. Hipsicle runs on top of Rockham and CUDA backends to provide support for AMD and NVIDIA GPUs, as well as support for any CPU via OpenMP. Finally, we have Sickle GTX, which is an early prototype implementation developed by Peter Zuzik, who is now at Codeplay. Sickle GTX is now largely used for experimenting with new features. So there are now many Sickle implementations to choose from, depending on which platform you are using. Many of these implementations also have their own extensions, so it's always worth checking these out as many of these can be early indicators of what is to come in future revisions of the standard. For the hands-on exercises in this tutorial, we will provide instructions for how to use Compute CPP, DPC++ and Hipsicle. Next we're going to look at what is in a Sickle implementation. First, every Sickle implementation must provide the standard Sickle API. This is a standard C++ template library that provides the features developers need to write Sickle applications. This same API is used for both host application code and device code. Next up is the Sickle runtime. This sits below the Sickle API and performs a number of functions. It loads and compiles kernels, it performs data dependency analysis, and it schedules all operations required to manage data and enqueue kernels to the backend. Next is the host device. The host device is an emulated Sickle device which guarantees the same execution and memory model as a regular Sickle device, but runs natively in the Sickle runtime. The host device can be used as a fallback and to debug kernel functions. Next up we have the backend API, such as OpenCL, that sits underneath the runtime and performs any commands enqueued to it for a particular device. The standard backend for Sickle 1.2.1 is OpenCL, but some implementations, as we've seen, support other backends. Finally, we have the device compiler. The Sickle device compiler is a standard C++ compiler which can parse and compile Sickle kernel functions and integrate with the Sickle runtime. The Sickle device compiler will output kernels in some binary format that can be consumed by a backend. This is often a standard IR such as Spear or Spear V, but can also be a proprietary IR like PTX or an IAC for a particular architecture. Now we're going to look at what a typical Sickle application looks like. For this, we're going to look at how to create a simple vector add application. Now we're only going to touch on these concepts to give you an idea of how everything fits together because we're going to dive much more further into these in later lectures. The first thing to do, like any library, is to include the header file. For Sickle, this is Sickle.hpp. Sickle.hpp includes the entire Sickle API, so that's everything you need to develop a Sickle application. We also import the CL Sickle namespace here to reduce the verbosity for the slide code. Now that we've included the header file, the first thing we need to do is create a queue to enqueue work to. One of the simplest ways to do this is to construct a queue object, initializing it with a device selector. A device selector is a function object which describes a heuristic for scoring devices. When you pass a device selector to the queue constructor, it will look at all the devices available in the system, score them all according to this heuristic, and choose the one with the highest score. In this case, we're using the GPU selector, which is one of the standard selectors provided with the Sickle API, which will only choose GPU devices. You can also construct a default queue, which will use the default selector to choose a device. The default selector is another standard selector, but its heuristic is implementation defined. Next, we have to create a command group. In Sickle, a command group represents a single unit of work that is enqueued to a queue to be scheduled. A command group represents a command such as a kernel function, often an ND range, and accessors which describe the dependencies. To create a command group, you call the submit member function on the queue. This function takes a callable, which itself takes a reference to a handler object. This function acts as a factory for constructing a command group by associating dependencies through accessors and a command, such as a kernel function, with the handler object. Now we initialize some vectors for our inputs and outputs. Then we create a buffer for each of these input and the output 
to manage the data across the host application and the device that we want to enqueue a kernel function to. To create the buffers, we specify an element type, a dimensionality, in this case float and 1, and initialize them with a pointer to the data and a range describing the number of elements. Buffers synchronize and copy back to the original pointer on destruction. So adding this scope triggers the synchronization and copies the result back to the output vector when this scope is left. Now we create accessors for each of these buffers to describe the data dependencies for the command group. To do this we call get access on the buffer objects providing the handler to create the association between the accessors and the command group. For the two input accessors we specify the access mode read. This tells the command group that we are only reading from the input buffers and it should not copy back to them. For the output accessors we specify the access mode write. This tells the command group that we are writing to it and it should copy back. Next we define the kernel function itself. To do this we call the parallel for member function on the handler object. We pass this a range to describe the range to invoke the kernel function over and a lambda representing the kernel function itself which takes an ID representing the current iteration. The kernel function performs a single vector add operation reading and writing from the accessors passing in the ID to the accessor subscript operators. This completes the application. If you were to compile and run this with proper initialized inputs it would enqueue a kernel on the GPU and return the result to the output vector. You'll probably notice though that the parallel for function also takes a template parameter. This is used to name the lambda. Since C++ does not have a standard ABI for lambdas, this is required to allow the host and device compilers to communicate. Cycle kernel names also follow C++ ODR rules, so if your kernel is defined in a template context, the name too must be templated. Finally, one other thing to add, and an important one. The cycle runtime manages errors by throwing exceptions. Some of these are thrown synchronously, and some of them are thrown asynchronously. In order to catch these, you must wrap the cycle application code in a try-catch block and provide an async handler to the queue. But I will explain more about this in this next lecture.